Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 17 to 26, uh, which is on uh, page 702 of the church's Bibles. If you don't have a Bible here with you uh, tonight and you need one, just raise your hand and uh, Lucas will bring you a Bible. Uh, If you don't have a Bible at all at home, uh, feel free to take one home as a gift from the church. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. The word of the Lord. I guess the last person that preached must have been very short. I don't... Uh, pray with me if you would. Uh, Father God, we, we love you. We thank you for your presence with us now. We thank you for your truth that never fails, Lord. Even though I do time and time again, you never fail. And I, I pray now, Lord, that, that your truth would, uh, would come into our hearts, would come into our lives and change us, Lord. Change the ways that we live. Uh, change the way that we love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So uh, the passage that we read today may be familiar to some of you. And uh, we see in this passage a, a man being brought before Jesus who's paralyzed, being brought wet by his friends, and he's seeking healing. And there are a couple of uh, key things that we can learn from this passage. There are a lot of things we can learn from this passage, but we'll focus on, on three um, and those are Jesus' identity. Who is Jesus? It'll be kingdom priorities. And by kingdom there, we mean God's kingdom. And then Jesus' mercy and compassion. But before we jump into those, I kind of want to start with a, with a foundational principle. Okay, We'll start with the principle that will set the context and a framework uh, as we work through this, this passage together. All right, And here's that, that principle. Okay, there's, there's one big overarching story through history, right? It starts with creation. One of the next major points is the entering of sin into the world through the choices of, of Adam and Eve. Right? Fast forward a couple of millennia later, Jesus enters the scene to set things right through his death, burial, and resurrection. And then it ends, as, as we understand, through Jesus' return to uh, formalize his kingdom on earth. Right? And in between are woven all kinds of, of different stories, like, like the Exodus, like Noah's Ark, like Daniel in the lion's den, uh, like the rise of the Roman Empire, like, like World War II. There are a lot of stories woven together, some of them big and some of them a little more mundane, like the Penders move to Massachusetts or Jonathan goes to CrossFit. <laughs> Did you guys know he goes to CrossFit? But each of, these, each of these stories, the big ones, the little ones, think of them as, a, as an individual thread, right, of, of different lengths, of different colors, of different characteristics. And God is weaving all of these together uh, to create a beautiful tapestry, a beautiful picture, right? And if you, if you accept that principle, it really changes the way 
that we interpret the events of life. The big things, the scary things, the hurtful things, even the, the comings and goings of everyday life when we start to see things through this lens. The difficult point, though, is that from our perspective, we see a very small part of that tapestry. And maybe it looks something like that. So you see, you see some colors, you see some, some pixels, you see maybe a pattern. But sometimes, mostly it feels chaotic. Sometimes it's hard to make sense of, of what's going on. Right? But as believers, we trust, we trust that God is working these individual threads together into something beautiful. Right? So that, that little snippet I took from the middle of this picture right, to, to help us realize that our story is, is not in and of itself. It's not a small bit, but it's part of the overall bigger story that, that God's weaving together. And, and I think this is, uh, in part, uh, the spirit behind Romans 8.28 that tells us, uh, all, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So that's, that's the principle that we, again, there's this big overarching story, individual threads that are your and my stories that are being woven together to create a, a big picture that oftentimes we don't have the perspective to see or to appreciate or to understand. Okay. So with that principle in mind, let's, let's go, up and go into the first point. And, and just to kind of keep it in our minds, I'll, I'll include these pictures on, on, uh, on both on every slide. So we have a picture of the chaos, the, the chaotic, limited perspective we have, but then the big picture. Okay. So the first point is, is Jesus' identity. And Luke 5, 21 to 22 reads, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Exactly. That was, that was his point, right? That was his whole point. Now, the Pharisees react kind of strongly. They, they say, wow, this guy's being blasphemous. But let's, let's cut him a little slack, okay? First of all, you know, the, to, to think that a man standing before them could forgive somebody's sin was, was unacceptable, right? And so they wanted to protect the honor and holiness of their God which I think is, is an admirable trait, right? And then if you consider, okay, here's, here's this guy that comes, he's, he's, he's going around preaching, doing some miracles. Maybe he's this promised Messiah that we've been looking for. Maybe, maybe he is. But in the theology of the Messiah, it's not included that he could forgive sins. Okay, so any, any chance that... Uh, that that someone may have accepted him as Messiah, maybe he just blew it out of the water by saying that he was God and he could forgive sins. Right? So they reacted pretty strongly, but ultimately, how they respond to, to Jesus is critical. And so it is for you and me. History's clear, right? Jesus, Jesus walked the earth. Scholars agree to that. From all walks of life, Jesus walked the earth. Um, so then the question is, well, what do you do with what Jesus said about himself? What do you do with teachings like this? What do you do with the miracles he performed? What do you do with the 500 people who saw him risen from the dead? If you think about it, that should really have a tremendous impact in our lives. And I'm not talking just about a come to know Jesus in a prayer at a church type of thing. I'm talking about for the way that we live everyday life, right? Are we living life in the confidence and in the hope and the power that, that he can provide us? It should have a tremendous impact on, on our lives. The, uh, so the question for us is then, again, how, how are we going to respond to Jesus? And who he is. And again, it's not merely a rhetorical question because the consequences are tremendous. 
It's not just a question for people who don't yet know Jesus. It's a question for every believer as well. Are you living your life in a way that reflects him as, as your king? So, so Jesus' identity is a, is a big point in this story. Uh, and when you realize that then that Jesus is king, when you realize that he's God, right, then it starts to become conceptually easier to accept, okay, so maybe his priorities, his kingdom, his big picture is more important than my solitary 80 years on, light, on earth. Right? So uh, let's go through that again because it's kind of a deep, uh, deep point. When you realize that Jesus is king and his kingdom is so much more expansive. And by expansive, we're talking about time. We're talking about people. Whatever measure you want to, to, to think about. Right? It's so much more significant than maybe his priorities right, are more important than my immediate circumstances. So, so let's unpack that for a moment. And, uh, and to do that, we'll, we'll kind of get to this, wait, what? Type of moment that we see in the passage today. So have you ever had a, a wait what moment? Right. So maybe, maybe you don't know what that is, but it, you know, for example, if you are uh, at a restaurant and you order a nice juicy bacon cheeseburger and you get a piece of dried baked chicken, that's a wait what? That's, that's not what I ordered, right? So it's ex- expecting one thing and, and getting something different. And one of my favorite examples uh, uh, comes personally when... Uh, when I asked Barry's dad for her hand in marriage. So you probably already know where, where this is going. But uh, it, was, it was over Thanksgiving break. Barry and I were still in school. And uh, we'd, Barry and I had been talking. And so now was the time for me to ask Barry's dad. And so I was, I was pretty nervous. I was pretty scared. I rehearsed what I was going to say. I had it all laid out and how it would play out. And um, the girls had gone out shopping. So it was just us at home doing important things like watching football. And so uh, I found him upstairs, and I said, okay, this is it. So I'll go in and lay it out there. I want to marry your daughter. All right, so uh, I'm expecting to hear in return, oh, Mark, that's great, or something like that. But instead, what I hear is, well, Mark, we'll have to talk about that. And so I was stunned, and so I kind of stagger out of the room, and uh, I'm holding my head, and I'm trying to make sense of this, trying to process this, right? Wait, what? That's, that's not what was supposed to happen. That's not how the story's supposed to go. And so I'm, I'm walking down the stairs, and he yells out, by the way, the answer is yes. So, whew, all right, that helped. But for the, for the wait what moment in, 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 this, in this story today, it helps to kind of put yourselves in the, in the shoes of the, of the paralytic, if you will. Um, so, so you're this person, you've, you've been paralyzed for, I don't know, let's say five years. Maybe it's your whole life, but we'll just say five years. Uh, and you've heard about this guy, Jesus, that's going from town to town. He's an amazing teacher, and he's providing healings like no one has ever done. Right? He's done amazing things. And so, uh, so you're excited for this chance to meet Jesus. And when you're paralyzed in that day, you, know, you can imagine there's not the kind of support systems that we would have in our society today, right? There's not, a, not insurance and government programs. There's no Americans with Disabilities Act, so you're, you're not working. You're going to be poor, right? Uh, so, so times are, are really difficult. And on top of that, if you're suffering from something like paralysis or other malady like that, a difficult thing in your life, a difficult burden. Everyone just assumed, well, this person's got some big sin in their life. That's why they got this big problem, right? So there's the stigma that, okay, you're also sinful on top of this and something big. We know that's not how God always works, right? Because we know in John chapter 9, when Jesus and his disciples are walking down the road, they, they encounter a guy that's been blind from birth, right? And, and the disciples go, hey, hey Jesus, who sinned, this, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Right? So you can see there's always already a presumption that there has to, be a, has to have been some sin that triggered this man's blindness. Right? And Jesus' answer is pretty to the point and pretty powerful. 
In John 9, 3, uh, it says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This happened that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, the, the kingdom priority of the works of God were greater than the nearly 30 years of burden that this man bore being blind. Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, to the man in the story today. He's, he's paralyzed, he's on a mat. You've, you've found some good friends, right? They're willing to carry you to go see Jesus, uh, despite this stigma. So, so you arrive at the house, and it's packed, right? It's two or three deep at the door and at the window, and your friends look down at you, and they're like, I don't know how we're going to do this. This is, this is crazy. It's, there's no room. How can we get in? Your friends don't give up. Uh, they go up on top of the roof, which is not as crazy as it sounds, right? Because a lot of houses back then had an external stairwell, a flat roof. So they go up, and uh, they start to make a hole in the roof. So you can imagine if you're on the inside of, what, all of a sudden, my house is becoming a convertible here, right? It's, the, the roof is coming off, and so everybody's kind of stepping back, and, and, and all of a sudden, they see you being lowered down in front of Jesus. So the crowd is just silent, going, what in the world is going on? What's going to happen? So everyone kind of stands there, is waiting to see. And suddenly, Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Wait, what? Jesus, I, I came to you because I, I'm paralyzed and I want to walk. Uh, don't get me wrong, having my sin forgiven, that, that's great, but I, I want to walk. And I think we've all had those kinds of moments with God. Right? We've all had that wait, what moment? Sorry, I think I skipped some uh, slides here. So this is the passage that we just read through, my, my rough paraphrase. So men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So a wait what moment? You know, we've probably had those times when, when we've been praying for one thing and seen something else happen, right? God, I was, I was praying uh, for a promotion and a, and, a, and a salary increase not to be laid off. <laughs> God, I was, I was praying to get better. Uh, I was praying that you would heal me, and, and nothing's changing. God, I was praying for some nice Christian neighbors to move in next door, and that would be fantastic, but not these people. God, I, I was praying that my, my kid would clean up their act, and they just got suspended again. Okay. That's not from personal experience. <laughs> God, don't, don't you hear me? Don't you understand? Don't you know how great this would be for your kingdom? And the answer is yes. He heard you. And he understands. And he knows what's good for his kingdom. A lot better than, than I do. Right? And with this paralytic man, Jesus knew that his eternal condition was much more important than the paralysis he had. And he knew that with his eternal condition secured, there's no option for paralysis in heaven. Right? That's not an option. You know, when Julia was born and had some, some difficult times, uh, it became pretty clear how easy it is to say something like this and then to try to live it out. Right? I had to learn to prioritize prayer for Julia's soul over stopping seizures, over the use of the left side of her, of her body. And as a dad, it's pretty tough because right? you want things to be better for your daughter. But I know that the eternal, the long game, the big picture is so much better, so much more important than what she'll face here.
And then with Jesus walking through her everyday life with her, she'll have the strength to overcome any obstacle in her path. Again, in heaven we can rest. There are no maladies that we'll face like we do here. And we can be sure that all the intricate and sometimes messy stories that are going on in your life and in my life and in everyone here, right? That they're being woven together for God's glory, right? We, we see this big picture here and it looks like a mess. Without God's perspective, that's all we see. And we say, okay, well, this has got to be the next best step, right? We begin prescribing to God, this is how it needs to work out. I, I see what's next. But faith teaches us again, that the bigger story that God's weaving together is so much better when it follows, follows his script. Because in that story, in that story uh, is the crowd. And in the crowd are people who need Jesus. And the other side of that conversation is Jesus himself who is worthy of all glory and honor and praise and things should work out to that end. But don't get me wrong, the big story is, is really important and it's beautiful. And locally, in small places in our lives, sometimes it's painful. But that doesn't mean God's not compassionate. God is so compassionate. And that's the next point, Jesus' is compassion. Luke 5, 24 to 25, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your home. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. That's our third point, a compassionate God. The Bible is replete with example of God's compassion. And I think one of the things we often forget is the fact that Jesus was standing in their presence is perhaps one of the greatest acts of, of his compassion, that he left the glory of heaven and put on a failing body like this and walked around in a sinful, dirty world to rub elbows with the needy, the people who were sinful and longing. Right? He did that out of his love for us. But one of my favorite examples in the New Testament actually comes just before this. It's in Luke 5, 12 to 16 or something like that. Yeah, 12 to 16, I think. Um, and here, it's an example of another healing, okay? Uh, so we'll read that verse. Oops. Yeah, so we'll read an excerpt from that story. Luke 5, 12 to 13. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Okay. So why is the fact that Jesus touched him significant, other than the fact that I made it red and underlined it and put it in italics? It's important. Um, well, if you think about it, having leprosy, uh, when you have leprosy, physical contact's probably not happening, right? Aside from the fact that it's just gross, um, you know, many of the skin diseases that fell under this category of leprosy would be contagious. And then the ceremonial laws of Moses said if you touch someone with leprosy, you yourself would become ceremonially unclean. But Jesus' love and compassion for this man were more important than the ceremonial laws. He put that aside because he knew that man hadn't been touched in who knows how long. He needed to be touched, he needed to be hugged, and I think you know what that's like sometimes. So we have a compassionate God. And when Jesus is asking the crowd, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. When he says that, he's weaving together these threads, these stories of everyone in that room, right? The man that's uh, 
paralyzed, his friends, the crowd, the Pharisees, the whole nation of Israel. Because in that moment, he's revealing his identity as God. He's providing uh, for the eternal condition of this man. And he's sharing his compassion by bringing him healing. It's a beautiful way that God just works that way together. It's a microcosm of, of this example, right? Of these pictures. Pick up your bed and go home. Oh, that's a win, 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 right? However many wins that is. Uh, but we know that the story doesn't always end like that, right? I, I'd be lying to you to say, you know, if you just pray and, and, and are faithful and, and things are going to work out perfectly every time, there's not going to be any problems. I'd be lying if, if I told you that. But be encouraged. Don't lose heart. Uh, this passage from, from 2 Corinthians uh, is an incredible encouragement to me. It, 2 Corinthians 4, 14 to 18. This is Paul uh, writing to the Corinthians. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Outwardly, we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles. It is not to say that Paul had an easy life. <laughs> he faced some pretty difficult things. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul's telling us, look guys, this is, this is what you see. This is what you feel. This is life today. But don't lose heart. This is the big picture. Right? Uh, some of you may know the story of, of Chuck Colson. Charles Colson, he was a central figure of, of the Watergate scandal. He was known as the hatchet man for, for President Richard Nixon. Uh, and he was a successful person by, by many standards, right? He, he graduated at Brown University with high honors, the same with George Washington Law. He became the youngest person to receive captain in the Marines. Uh, very decorated person. Uh, he was on several successful political campaigns, and then at the age of 38, became special counsel to President Nixon, the most powerful man in the world. Very successful. But uh, Richard Nixon, or sorry, uh, Chuck Colson um, was known as a pretty ruthless, vicious political force. There were a few lows that he would not stoop to to advance his cause. And as... Uh, as the story of Watergate started to unfold and Nixon's recording started coming out, uh, prosecutors quickly zeroed in as, on Chuck Colson as a, as a primary target. The difficulty was that they were having uh, problems finding uh, charges that would stick. You see, a lot of what Chuck Colson had done had been morally bankrupt and terrible, but not criminal. During this time, uh, Chuck Colson came to know the Lord Jesus And in a leap of his newfound faith, he said, you know what? I'm going to tell the judge what I did do that was criminal. So he voluntarily told him, hey, this is what I did. And he expected mercy and leniency from the judge because he did it. He was wrong. He was wrong. He, he lost his license to practice law, and he was sent to prison. And uh, he became the, the subject of a lot of mocking in the press uh, many saw it as a ploy, his conversion as a ploy to escape uh, harsher punishment. Right? And uh, he was, became the, the center of many political cartoons and uh, just really beat up in the press. Uh, and he was quoted by the papers, What happened in court today was the court's the will and the Lord's will. I've committed my life to Jesus Christ, and I can work for him in prison as well as out. After Chuck had been in prison for a little bit, he, he learned that some of the other uh, people involved in Watergate had actually gotten an early release. And so he started to, to think, hey, well, maybe that can apply to me too. He was wrong. He was denied. 
At about the same time, he learned that his son had been arrested for drug possession. Right? And what do you need when you're arrested? A lawyer. And Chuck Colson was a lawyer. And he's like, ah, if I could just help my son. And it's, it's at this point, this really low point in his life, that he prayed this prayer. Lord, if this is what this is all about, then I thank you. I, thank, I praise you for leaving me in prison, for letting, me, letting them take away my license to practice law. Yes, even for my son being arrested. I praise you for giving me your love through these men, for being God, and for just letting me walk with Jesus. <laughs> wow. This is a new believer in Christ. Would you be able to say, thank you for leaving me in prison? That's, that's pretty challenging. But Chuck Colson would go, later say that this prayer, this conversation he had with God was really a turning point in his life because he said, after that, never had I felt freer in my life from prison. Shortly after his release, Chuck Colson uh, got audience with the uh, national director of of, of prisons, and he laid out his vision for what would become uh, Prison Fellowship Ministries. Prison Fellowship Ministries, if you're not familiar with it, it's a fantastic program. In the 40 plus years since its inception, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men and women have heard about the hope of Jesus Christ. It's been demonstrated time and time again that people have walked through Prison Fellowship Ministries demonstrate a lower recidivism rate or a le- least likely to, to go back to prison, less likely to go back to prison. Uh, thousands of leaders have been equipped with leadership skills to use in prison as well as when they leave. And thousands and thousands and thousands of children of incarcerated parents have been given Christmas presents through the Angel Tree program so they can keep alive that, that bond of family even while their parent is in jail. You know, Chuck's, Chuck's heart for these prisoners was forged while he was a prisoner himself. God used the lowest point of his life to bring hope and freedom to so many. But if you back up in the story a little bit, had Chuck Colson received the mercy and leniency he had hoped to receive from the judge, and he escaped his uh, prison sentence, things would have been a lot different. He would have read passages like Isaiah 61.1 and Matthew 25.34-40, which talk about prison ministry. He would have read those a lot differently. Right? At the moment, it looked like that. But we know God was weaving something much more beautiful. So uh, as we close, I just want to leave you with a, with a few, few points. Um, the first one is, like this man in this day's story, Jesus will forgive our sin when we humble ourselves before him. Not when we clean up our act, not when we get all of our ducks in a row, but when we realize our need for him. The second one is, is Jesus is so compassionate. He knows what's going on in your life right now. And he wants to walk with you. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear your heart crying out. He wants to walk with you in your troubles today, and he wants to walk with you in heaven for eternity. He's still demonstrating his compassion today. The stories are all around this church. And then finally, God our King is alive and active and working in our midst today to do great things for his kingdom. Right now, he's weaving our stories together, your story and my story, all of our stories, into something beautiful. And I'm so happy to be here with you and be a part of of what God's doing. Pray with me, if you would. Father God, we, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for uh, being king. 
may we live in a way that shows you are king in our life. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for being in control, Lord. Because so often things seem out of control. Thank you, Lord, that you have the best picture in view. And I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, align our hearts with, with yours so that we want the same thing. I pray, Lord God, that you would give us faith to trust your script is better than, than what we can imagine. I thank you that, that you are alive and work at work today in this community, in this church. And I just uh, I pray that you great, do great things through us, Lord, whatever it takes. In Jesus' name, amen.